All right, our first contestant was unanimously selected by the city council in 2017 to fill the district five seat vacated by state representative John Autry. In 2018, she won a successful at-large campaign and is a sitting member of the council, a former certified public accountant. She made history by becoming the first Asian American and youngest woman to serve on Charlotte City Council. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Creative Morning Stage, Councilwoman Dimple Ajmira. Come on up, Dimple. Our next contestant was elected in 2017 as the District 6 representative and is serving his first term on the council. He is an influential leader in the fintech industry and serves as the executive director of the Carolina Fintech Hub. Please welcome Councilman Tariq Bakari. What up, Tariq? Our next contestant was elected in 2017 as the District 1 representative. He is serving his first term on the council. He represents Re uh, Republic National Distribution Company, uh, Distributing Company and is a brand ambassador for Western North Carolina. And I have to say, if you were here early in the Creative Mornings days, I'm talking like three years ago, we put Mr. Eggleton in a cash booth where he caught money in the cash booth, but that's a story for another day. He's written for local publications. He serves on an advisory board for CPCC's Culinary Arts Program. He's a volunteer firefighter for the Long Creek Volunteer Fire Department, among many other things. Please welcome to the stage, Councilman Larkin Eggleston, everybody. So we're gonna do a little bit, for the next 20 minutes, we're gonna do kind of a little round robin with our esteemed elected leaders here. Because our theme of the morning is symmetry. And we find that really compelling with this lineup because they are all symmetrical in that they all have a true calling to serve Charlotte. But we also recognize, recognize them as being asymmetrical in the sense that they have specific creative passions that speak to them and that they're bringing into their public service. So we love that sort of dichotomy and the tension between the, the value of, of being symmetrical and the value of being asymmetrical uh, as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring them up one at a time and they're gonna have three minutes each to answer the question or to speak on the question of what is the thing they most want to accomplish while in public office? Three minutes to talk on that. And then we'll have two minutes after each one for their colleagues to kind of comment on that or praise them or whatever else they wanna do. <laughs> so it's totally up, this is their time. So um, let's start with Larkin. Larkin, come on up. I'm Larkin Eggleston, I represent District 1, and I will preface all of us by saying I don't want anyone to leave and think that the thing I'm going to talk about is the most important thing that the City Council is going to do in the next year or three years. We've all put a focus on affordable housing, on mass transit, on upward mobility, things like that. Those are, those are the Council's priorities that we all share. We wanted to talk about things that we each individually find really important and, and are very passionate about. And so for me, that's historic preservation and adaptive reuse. Uh, just yesterday morning, we were out in the university area. The city donated $50,000 to the Charlotte Museum of History to help save the Siloam School, which is a school for African-American children in the era of Rosenwald schools, if you know those stories. And so I think it's really important. Charlotte has a really rich history uh, of things that we did well and things that we did not do so well. Uh, the history of segregation in this community is one that we did not do well, but it's something that we have to be able to acknowledge and we have to be able to save the places like the Shalom School that tell that story so that people, we can take students there, they can learn the history not just in a book, not just by reading a plaque in front of that uh, piece of land, but that they can go into that school and feel the spirit and feel the, um, feel the emotions that go along with being in something like that and thinking about how in our own community, black children had to go to a lesser school than white children. We can't tell those stories on paper the way that we can tell them with places. And I think preservation is important from that perspective. It's important for the affordability perspective that's important to so many of us. Older buildings are, are more cost effective. There are ways that we can adapt old buildings like one in my district right now that's an, a historic church that's being turned into affordable apartments. There's a historic church in Noda that we just rezoned so that it can be turned into a co-working space. Finding new ways to use old buildings helps preserve a lot of the character in our community that makes us unique, makes us different, makes people want to come to Charlotte and want to stay here. So I don't know if that's three minutes. I feel like it probably was, but that's something that is really important to me and it has been and will continue to be a focus of my service on Charlotte City Council. That's something that we historically have not done in, in this community. The Charlotte way uh, is to knock down what is old and, and put up new shiny things. Um, I think Larkin kind of hit the nail on the head. Um, we have a rich history. You know, we, we feel like we're a new emerging city, but in the same sense, we're celebrating 
a, a city that's been around for 250 years this year. Um, but where is that? Where is that history? Um, that's on the same timeline as 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 you know New York City, Philly, and all, and all of, all of those types of places. So, you know, as we want to be an international destination, we want people to come to stuff, and people can see new shiny stuff wherever uh, they go in the world. But they want to when they come here, they want to see things that are specifically Charlotte. We have to do a better job at that. So I couldn't agree more with my colleagues here. Uh, I was traveling to Hawaii uh, late last year, and we were touring some historic places. And it just made me realize that Charlotte has a lot of rich history. But as we are developing at such a fast pace, we are seeing a lot of that history being torn down. So it's important to have uh, someone who is so passionate and someone who has worked before in historic uh, preservation board. And I know Larkin was on that board. So it's good to have that passionate advocacy on city council and also help us educate on some of the issues that we may not be aware of. So um, I think historic preservation plays an important part as we uh, grow and um, as we do our future planning and development projects. Yep. And I, uh, I, I actually, I love getting to serve with all these folks because you come in here with your own set of priorities, things you care about, things you know about, and then as you build relationships with them, you start to learn about their passion areas. So I've learned a ton from all of them, and Larkin's example is a great one of, you know, adaptive reuse and things like that. Didn't even know the word before I met him, so now I've learned so much. <laughs> all right, very good. Well, as long as we're on Utah, come on up. Let's do your three minutes. And I've, I've been told to tackle you if I have to. Your so. home crowd, huh, Larkin? Let's see after this speech. All right, here we go. Start the so clock. I got, I got three things. One I'm real passionate about is fintech and upward mobility. I have my personal upward mobility story I won't bore you with, but it actually kind of came to be and was possible because I learned about fintech. And I stumbled into this world, and it has done so well by me in my life, my family, my career, that now we're launching a new program with the Carolina FinTech Hub that actually impacts upward mobility. Uh, applications close on Monday, um, but we're looking for folks that are upward mobility candidates who have challenges, maybe couldn't go to a four-year college, didn't get exposed to this, they can come and apply um, uh, at carolinafintechhub.org slash win, Workforce Investment Network, and, um, and we're going to train them and pay them and give them a job. So that is, is a great example of private sector impacting that. Second thing is communication and uh, reaching out to millennials, particularly, and get them involved in leadership, public service. Larkin and I have a podcast, R&D in the QC. If you're not a uh, subscriber of that, do it. We talk every week in kind of layman's terms on what's going on. And then three, and finally, music. Um, we, we love music. We love the music scene. We have a music initiative. Um, yeah, ben, can you guys like kick me a beat or something for this? <laughs> For this last one? Yeah, there they are. All right, kicking me beat. The mu music is so important. I love music. I love freestyle and hip hop and symphony. Go ahead, guys. Yeah, keep it going. There we go. All right. <clears throat> I'll, I'll close with this. <clears throat> there it is. There it is. Now let me welcome everybody to the CLT, a state that's untouchable like Larkin and me. We got Braxton and Dimple, and the stuff we deal with, it's just, just not simple. So we get together on Monday nights and talk, 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 and talk. And sometimes we execute, and that's when we start stealing the taxpayers' loot. Stuff like roads and sidewalks and light rail. And what's that other thing? Oh, the Cross Charlotte Trail. Yeah, y'all remember that thing. It's kind of hard for us to manage, but don't fear, don't worry, shorty. Keep electing people under the age of 40. <laughs> Home crowd. Home crowd now, Larkin. What? <laughs> Vote Republican. Har Harvey almost changed his mind about dapping you up when you said that last part. He's like, oh, wait, I don't know. <laughs> All right, three minutes of reply to that. Here we go. That was something. Tark likes to act like he wings. 
everything. Clearly, he's been practicing in the mirror for a week. Um, but I will say, job well done. Um, he said he hadn't heard, term, heard the term before, or adaptive reuse before he got on council and, and found somebody who was passionate about it. None of us knew much about FinTech before. Uh, he re just talked about it incessantly, and we thought it was just a, a him thing. We've since heard lots of people much smarter than him that have said, <laughs> yeah, he's right. FinTech are the jobs of the future, and Charlotte can be a place that can capture a lot of that growth. And so um, it has been something that he has made a focus on this council and is a way that we can create jobs on the financial foundation that this city already has, but with the, the way that jobs are moving now being more technologically driven, um, Charlotte can be at the forefront of that. Yeah, uh, what FinTech does, it, it allows us to really diversify our, um, our economic base, and that's what we really need to do in this city. Bringing in, in companies like Honeywell, with the largest industrial producer in the world, um, are another example of that. But FinTech is a workforce development path uh, that people can graduate out of high school and get good, good paying jobs. I'm talking about $70,000 a year jobs straight out of high school. Um, and, and in terms of the music scene, that's something that I'm passionate about as well. I, I work in entertainment production, been a stagehand since 2004, and I really do think our our entire city is 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 really well set up to do something big. Like we should claim something like Austin City Limits that that doesn't just happen over a week or a couple weeks, but 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 really lives a, as a laboratory over a full year. If you look at all the venues, uh, you know, from from the Blumenthal to the arena to to uh, the the baseball stadium and and everything in between, you know, there are so many venues. We should have those things. We should have those things sold out, you know, all at the same time, as opposed to competing against one another, we have to find ways to collaborate and do something real big. It would have helped if we hadn't torn down Double Door in Tremont. Yeah. Hell has frozen over. Here we are. Politicians are speechless. No. Um, now, here's the thing. I loved that. That was awesome. I gotta, we're going to hug it out later because that was Definitely. amazing. Um, and I also miss Tremont. In fact, back in the band days, we opened for Flock of Seagulls at Tremont Music Hall. Just wanted to say that. Three okay, moving on. You've got three um, Flock of Seagulls fans out there. <laughs> That's how many were there that night, too. All right, Dimple, three minutes. Come on up. Good morning. I'm Dimple, Dimple Ajmera, your Charlotte City Council member at large. And if you're all wondering, yes, Dimple is my real name. So just a little bit about me. Um, I love fresh vegetables and fruits. Uh, I drive an electric car. Uh, I meditate regularly. And I worship trees. And no, I'm not a hippie. <laughs> I'm an Indian American. Well, with jokes apart, sustainable is something that is very important to me. Sustainable lifestyle. It is very near and dear to my heart. And maybe that's the reason Mayor asked me to lead an environment committee. And as we grow as a city with 60 to 70 people moving in every single day, we have to make sure that we protect and preserve our ecosystem as we continue with this growth. And especially as we consider our future planning and development and our UDO, which is our, uh, our ordinance, to ensure that we are really uh, ensuring the clean air clean water, and good soil for generations to come. Especially in an urban lifestyle that we live today. Sustainability is not something is an option anymore. It is something that is so important that we have its essential part of 21st century, that if we want to continue to not just thrive, but survive. So with that commitment, last year, uh, we have been able to take some bold steps in sustainability and resiliency, starting out with a resolution followed by a strategic energy action plan, which sets a framework for our city to transition to low carbon future. And that was the first plan that your city council adopted, and this is the first plan in place that we implemented in just last year. So thanks to all my colleagues here, uh, that serve with me to continue to push for that because we do need to take important steps to be more sustainable and resilient. And thank you. And last, 
we were also awarded American Cities Climate Challenge. And I'm sure many of you know when Mayor Bloomberg was here late last year and gave us additional resources to fight the climate challenge and to fight the climate change, because we do need powerful ally like Bloomberg Foundation to help us meet our 2030 and 2050 clean energy goals. So in closing, I will say this, that as you all live and lead a life I implore you to visit how you lead your life. Maybe take stairs, you have the stairs challenge. Look at where you visit and uh, buy your groceries. Maybe support local farmers. Or maybe uh, take a, a public transportation system. Use our public transportation system. Or even walk instead of driving to a neighbor, uh, neighborhood grocery store. We'll because it's gonna take all of us to uh, create a sustainable and resilient place to live and work. Thank you. Dimple, Dimple during the strategic energy action plan process had the th incredibly thankless task of trying to convene like 30 stakeholders from the community, some of whom were just worried about trees and some of whom were just worried about air quality and some just about water quality and try to get them all on the same page for this uh, big comprehensive plan. Uh, it took a lot of meetings and a lot of time, and um, so that that was not an easy process. It's something that we all believed in, kind of generally speaking, but then to really nail down into the details of what that means for people who have often divergent views on what's most important and how it should be accomplished um, was a difficult task, but she, she managed to pull it off. Did I hear you right that you have an electric car that runs on fresh fruits and vegetables? <laughs> um, I got to see that. I, the only thing I'd say is Dimple future. has done some great work on that. I've learned a lot more on environmental related items. Uh, and w one thing that I've learned, and well, I think one of the things we need to figure out, I, wouldn't, I don't want to paint Republicans with a broad brush, but we... We either, do. Yeah, you do. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, the, the Republicans I'm around, we, we all give a shit about the environment too. I mean, so... I, I need to figure out how to get more people on my side of the aisle to really embrace that kind of stuff and not feel like it needs to be a divisive issue. And I think once we do, we'll be able to come to the table and talk about some important things. Tactically, I've learned in Charlotte, there are these two sects of groups like West Side Story gangs. One's like the tree gang and one's the sidewalk gang. <laughs> and unfortunately, we have policies and ordinances that puts them at odds. We need to sit down and say, how do we really prioritize it, it between two very important things? So I think that's how we can pragmatically get to the next step of, of where Dimple's and, taken us. And I think one of the ways that you, you do that is this CAP is really Republican, a, a, I heard you. A, a sweeping, it really is a sweeping, bold uh, policy change. And, and that, that can really spur some really uh, 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 big economic development um, projects as we look at the way we use our buildings, we look at the way we use our cars and, and our fleets. Um, but we're going to need you all to get smart about this policy because we have set goals that we can't do on our own that we need to put pressure on different branches of government like the county like CMS like the state and federal government to buy into but we also need businesses to buy into this and and and, and take our lead and see what we're doing um, as, as as one of the leading employers in this city the city employs 8,000 people so what we can do with our workforce and, and with our buildings and our resources and our facilities so can everybody else out there running a the business quick crossover plug, the greenest buildings are the buildings that already exist. Tearing down an old building to build a new one is not green. So when I got into this whole world of politics, social activism, and everything like that, I come from the firm belief that democracy works better when more people are involved. And that's all I've ever tried to do in this. Make sure that more voices that haven't been heard at the tables where policy and, and practices are being made are heard. Um, so I think that's what this idea of social justice really does um, uh, uh, mean. You don't work you don't, you don't work, you don't put what you want on the community. You go to the community and figure out what they want and you execute, and you execute with them, not for them. You know, uh, so that's what, I, that's what I've tried to do. You know, we all got elected with the largest percentage ever of, of, of people to participate in a municipal election, but that number was less than 25%, and that's crazy. And that's crazy. We need that number to be up at 85% because what government is, 
It is a tool for the people to use. It is not good when we are coming up, with, trying to come up with the ideas and push those forward. It's better when you guys come to us and tell us this is what you want us to do. And then we work along to, 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 to kind of push you in the right direction. To, and, and that can only happen when, when there is a, a critical mass of, of people who are participating and using that tool. So I, I've, I've tried to, 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 to work with groups, work with individuals to encourage them to come to us, come to our meetings, don't be afraid of our chamber. Find different ways, use email, organize. Organize, 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 because that's what social justice really is. It's an organized group of people that are working for the good of that group. And some people really do get it. You can see that play out every day in, in government. Um, and I think, I think, I think it, we have to, to kind of self-check ourselves to say that, yes, we can do this. We can do this. We don't have to wait for anybody to do that for, for us. So I encourage you guys, continue to organize and come and use the, the, the tool of government that it is, because it's very powerful uh, when you assert yourself, insert your voices, and hold our feet to the fire to do the things that you want us to do. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, as in every other case, I've learned a ton from Braxton and it, his grassroots understanding and, and, and track record and history is just incredible. It's incredibly impressive. I think the one, we've had some awesome debates over the last year, you and I, uh, and uh, on many different topics. I think the one thing we're still debating is <clears throat> when, you, when you, I love listening to the people and I love a activating them, but usually they come with one thing. That's their thing. Go back to the, to the point of assume everybody thinks walkability with sidewalks and trees and saving our tree canopy is important in this room, right? Show of hands on how many of you would come to us and say, when you have a, d d uh, a contradictory decision that has to make, make your policy default to tree save. How many of you would raise your hands that you would, you would lobby us on that? And then how many of you would default to walkability and more sidewalks if those two things are in contradiction? And how many of you don't, <laughs> don't care? <laughs> Fantastic. But that's the point. Like, it, it, these are hard choices. So I appreciate everything, and, and I agree with them. We need to activate. But there's a level of, like, education, and then there's a level of dichotomy in all the different kind of specialty groups um, that makes it very challenging to govern. Matt had already told you that that poll would be futile because out of 550 people, 33 people took their survey. Yeah, so yeah. you should have expected no one was going to vote in yours either. But they all voted in the election. Yes, yeah, those but, 33. But that's um, why it's important to organize because it is going to be, e even in, in, in those small numbers, it's going to be those ones that are best organized and are at the table that are going to get those things done. So the more that we are elected to make the best decisions for the whole. So the more voices that we hear, the more input, the more information, the more data we have to make a better decision. So even if it is, it, 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 it is, it is a zoomed in view, we need more of those zoomed in views to make better decisions. I think, <laughs> agreed. I think one of the most important things about the council that we've got now, it, the diversity is important for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is, as Braxton said, the more people that are engaged in our democracy, the more effective it is more people will engage as they see themselves in their elected leaders. And so 30 years ago in Charlotte, all your elected leaders would have been old white guys. And that's not to say that those old white guys didn't have something to contribute, but there were a lot of other perspectives that weren't being heard or didn't have a voice at the table or seat at the table. And so when you've got an Indian American, when you've got somebody who's half Pakistani, when you've got somebody who's a young guy with dreads that 30 years ago, nobody would have thought somebody with dreads that had been out in the streets during the protest of 2016 could be on city council. Now people look and say, my leadership looks like me. And I think that having that diversity, we've got a member of the city council who's a member of the LGBT community. 30 years ago, that wouldn't have been possible. Not, not out openly gay. And so I think people can look at the leadership and say, that reflects me in some way, or someone there reflects me. And I want to engage with that in a way that they probably wouldn't have before. And Larkin, representing the young hipster white dudes, you know? I mean. <laughs> You can do it too, guys. <laughs> hey, there's a lot. You don't just lot. have to like put patchouli on and go ride your scooter around no die. You can run for office. The, the South Park guy doesn't know the difference between hipster and hippie. We don't use patchouli, but there's plenty of us They in don't here. sell it at the South Park Mall. I'm sorry. I don't know. <laughs> so with that, if you have to go back to the office, it's cool. But if you have a question for one of our four 
council members, or for all of them, raise your hand and we'll spend the next 10 minutes, if that's cool with you guys, uh, answering some questions. All right, let's start right here in the middle. Mrs. Miner. I agree with what you say about organization. I think it's really powerful. But how do we temper it with respect? Because I think a lot of times today when I think of organization, I think of something that's more riotous and gets out of control. And then it gets a really bad rap and it's not effective. I mean, that's something we deal with on council, right? We, we uh, this, this idea between symmetry and asymmetry is that we don't agree with each other all the time. But you have to fight to be effective. You have to find ways to achieve common ground, and you have to understand. You, you don't want to employ the tools of your oppressor, right? You don't want to. If you want something, something that you've never had, that your community has never been able to have, you don't want to all of a sudden just run over everybody else to get it. So you have to find ways to have common ground and be patiently urgent. Shoot for the stars. But when you don't get there, you just have to keep going. You can't get frustrated. You got to keep breathing. And, and, you, and you have to just, just, just keep going. If, if you really want to be effective, you, you have to continue to live inside yourself, and meditate, and, 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 and self-correct. You can't let other people kind of control your narrative. Yes, there, she said that, that sometimes there will be outside forces. There will always be, but again, you have to control your own narrative and don't let other people control that for you. All right, we have a question here. I had no idea what to expect when you guys got elected, and it is so refreshing. And it feels like... It feels like you have an authentic mutual respect that is so missing in politics across our nation. Anybody want to comment on that? It's definitely missing across our nation, and part of it is the issues that we deal with aren't as inherently partisan as the ones that they deal with in Raleigh and Washington. So I think that helps facilitate that. But then I also think you can't let, you, I, would, I would say you'd be surprised, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, the amount of grief that Tarek, for instance, gets for being friendly with Democrats or that the three of us get for being friendly with him or, or Ed, the other Republican on council, people act like we shouldn't work together, that we shouldn't be friends, that we shouldn't have that respect that you mentioned. And they complain about the lack of what gets done in Washington and Raleigh, but then they want us to emulate it. And then when we only have, as Braxton said, 22% of people turn out for a municipal primary, which we're up again in September of 2019, FYI, those people that are turning out are the most far right and the most far left, generally speaking. They're not going, they're not going to elect people who want to work together to get stuff done for the city. If everybody voted in elections, you'd have a lot more collaborative elected officials. But... Um, so you, you have to make sure your friends get out and vote for people who are working together to get stuff done for the city. I think we got time for like two more questions, so here we go. Okay, so I understand that you have to come with multiple ideas to the table, but sometimes there's an urgency of now, like the Brook Hill community. What are you doing for the citizens in the Brook Hill community as far as low income housing? Specifically with the Brook Hill community, there's not much that we as a city can do through a policy. That's a privately owned, privately owned land. Just like I can't come into your house and tell you what you what you can do with it. But what we can do is we can help broker conversation. We can we can we can continue to create far-reaching policies to say if you want help from, from from us from a city this is what we expect and so this is what we're doing as we build our, 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 our housing framework uh, in terms of how we're going to continue to develop our, 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 our the land that we do have control over um, this is how we, we uh, as we're bringing stakeholders to the table as we do our comprehensive plan our development plan that hasn't been touched in 50 years which allows things like Brook Hill so we, we we do this through, through, through working with policy, but also using the power of being a convener and bringing the right people to, to the table and holding their feet to the fire when they're at that table. All right, final question over here. Oh, Matt, oh, sorry, just, Temple, you wanted to say something? Yes, I just wanted to um, talk about uh, several policy decisions that we have made for an immediate relief. So we had passed last year aging in place program that's in addition to the homestead exemption that is currently in place. So that allows people to age in place, and um, yeah. especially with those with in limited resources, especially our seniors who might be on limited 
fixed income. So we do, ma we have made some very aggressive policy decisions, but when it comes to controlling the private property, that's not something within our jurisdiction. But we have taken aggressive steps in passing the $50 million bond referendum last year, thanks to you all for passing that bond referendum aging in place program and so many other initiatives that we have for affordable housing that we have worked last year on. Well, I, they are, I, would, I would say that keep an eye out for Brook Hill. I think there are some, some positive things coming up um, are, 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 are just around the corner. Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, one more. Hi, I'm Judy Jeffries. I come from one of the most diverse communities in Charlotte, Marwood Acres, thank you very much. My question is about the zoning ordinance. Back in the 90s, 13 of us got together and we sued the city of Charlotte over that ding-dang zoning and ordinance and we won and we shut down construction for six months. However, the zoning ordinance is still terrible. Mm -hmm. is there, are there any plans to do anything to take that huge thing and update it? We are we're in the, we're in the two, uh, year two of a four-year process. Uh, we had to recalibrate. It's one of the things that we got. Uh, we we uh, gave uh, our staff political kind of will to do is is we what they were doing is it was a backward process. What they were doing the unified development ordinance, which was is basically creating I guess the rules before you create the game. So what we're doing right now is creating a comprehensive vision plan of what we want our city to look like and which we will operate under for the next 50 years. Uh, so there are there's work being done right now, work that you can be part of. Um, it just th There's a UDO website that kind of will, will, will keep you updated with all the meetings and, and the steps w w that we're at right now. Ladies and gentlemen, Lark and Tark, Dimple and Braxton. Thank you guys so much. We love y'all for being a part of this. Boy can rap too, I love that. Thanks for hanging in there. We love you all and we'll see you next month. Bye everyone.